All right. Good deal. Thank you. All right. You turn over the slides. All right. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. Does everybody have a handout? Yes. Is there anyone that doesn't have one? I got some extra ones here. I'll give those to you to pass out. All right. So are you guys good for the next three and a half hours? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Yes. Uh, bringing food? Bringing food. All right. No. All right. Nope. Anyway, I'm going to go for about 90 minutes. I'm going to go straight through. If you guys got to get up and use the restroom or stretch or, you know, whatnot, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. Um, so this concept that I'm going to go over tonight, I'm going to teach you how to build your wealth through your own debts and expenses that you already have. I'm going to show you how to get all the money back on all the cars you're ever going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. Um, I'm going to show you how you can borrow at a higher interest rate than actually what you're earning and just make money all day long. And I'm going to do this without you having to do any harder work, without you having to change your cash flow, without you having to take any additional risk or lose control of your money. All we're going to do is add one step into your financial life. It's not, so again, don't make it overcomplicated because it's not. It's very simple. I'm not here to ask you to buy anything. I'm not going to sell you anything. As a matter of fact, I will not even have your contact information unless you give it to me at the end of the evening. And on the very last page of the handout, so if you choose to give me your contact info, great. And if you don't, that's okay too, all right? I'm just here to teach you these concepts. And hopefully if you like the stuff that I teach you and you decide this is something you want to do, then I'll be the guy that you do it with. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, anyway, just to give you a little bit about my background, I have been doing this now for about eight years. I'm actually a chiropractor. I no longer practice. I own five clinics in the Kansas City area. I sold my last clinic in 2017. And now I travel around and I teach this concept. I do about anywhere between 60 to 70 events a year. I've spoken on the stage with Grant Cardone, with Les Brown, and uh, people like that. Everything I do is word of mouth and referral. The reason that I'm here tonight is because Christina came to an event that I was at last year. It was another real estate event, and she saw me speak. And she says, hey, Brent, you got to come and speak to my group. So that's why I'm here. So, Christina, thank you for having me here. And hopefully, maybe if you guys have a group that after I go over this that, that somebody else just should hear, maybe you'll ask me to come and speak to your group. Um, I actually came here today from my hometown of Port Orange, Florida, which is right next. Yeah, you know Port Orange? Where, where at Daytona Beach? Or? Okay, Merritt Island's close. Yeah, so anyway, I came here this morning from uh, Daytona, so I got up at 12 midnight Pacific time to catch my flight, <laughs> right? So, um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, I lived down there. I, um, so, um, so, yeah, so, okay, so like, anyway, I grew up in Florida, and then I went to chiropractic college in St. Louis. I met another guy here that went to the same chiropractic college that I did, and then um, my wife and I, um, after school, I went over to Kansas City, and that's where I opened up my clinics. But I grew up in Florida, and so my kids, um, so, okay, so my kids, okay, so I just graduated high school um, about, oh, I guess it was last year, so my wife and I just became empty nesters. So both of us decided to move to Florida where it's warmer. So if you see my kids, don't tell them where we moved. <laughs> All right? So yeah, so anyway, I live in an airplane community in, um, down in Port Orange, I'm a pilot, so that's my hobby. Um, I love to fly, and so the reason I moved there is I wanted an airplane hangar attached to my house. So that's why we moved to this place called Port Orange. So anyway, as Christina said, I'm Brent Kessler. The name of my company is The Money Multiplier. And um, let's just get right into it. Oh, let me get it started here. Get the, okay, so as Christina said, I paid off $984,711 in debt in 39 months. Now, you're probably thinking, well, how does a guy from Kansas get to be almost a million dollars in debt, right? I know in California that buys a very small house, <laughs> but in Kansas it buys a lot. Well, here's how I came up with that debt. I had my student loans from chiropractic college. I had the house, okay, so that I was in. Um, I also had my chiropractic clinic. 
We have a house on the lake of the Ozarks between St. Louis and Kansas City. And if you have a house on the lake, the thing you have to have is a boat and a wave runner, don't you? I mean, you can't have a house on the lake without a boat and a wave runner. I'm also, a, again, as I said, I'm an airplane pilot. So as a pilot, I have to have my own airplane. So it didn't take me a lot to become almost a million dollars in debt. Well, I paid that off in three years and three months. Didn't have to work any harder, change my cash flow, take any additional risk or lose control. I just added one step in my financial life. And that's what I'm going to share with you. Now, I said I'm not here to sell you anything, and I'm not. But this is definitely a book that you want to add to your wealth building library. This book changed my financial life. It's called Becoming Your Own Banker. It's by a guy named R. Nelson Nash from Alabama. And actually, Nelson just passed away this past March. But this book completely changed my life. And if you're like me and have a little ADD going on or maybe don't like to read, it also has two hours of audio with it as well. So the thing you can do is go order it on okay the website or um, so go to Amazon or if you go to our website you can order it there too I'm not here to sell you a book I just want you to know where this information is coming from I'm gonna go over a couple other books too that you definitely need to have now just so we're totally clear of what we're gonna be talking about for the next 90 minutes <laughs> actually earlier it was louder Okay, so we're going to talk about money, all right? But in order to talk about money, the thing that we have to have is a definition of money, right? So if I ask you to tell me the definition of money, so what would you say? The definition of money is what? Currency. Currency? Exchange. 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 That's all money is, is a means of exchange, is it not? Because all we do with money all day long is exchange it for products and services. We exchange money for food, food for money, car for money, money for car, house for money, money for house, right? That's all we do with money is exchange it. So that's our definition for the next 90 minutes. Are we good with that? Yeah. Okay? All right, very good. Now, I'm not going to play this, but this is your homework. I want you to go to YouTube, and I want you to watch the Backward Bicycle. It's about an eight-minute video. It's about an eight-minute video. Have you seen it? It's called The Backward Bicycle, and this is the way it starts out. Okay, I'm not going to play that. So can we turn this up a little, though? Because I'm going to play something else next. Okay, so anyway, go to YouTube and watch the Backward Bicycle. So write that down so you don't um, forget to watch it. We'll go up because the next one I'm just going to play a little clip, if we can. If not, I'll skip it. It's, oh, it's just coming out of the computer. That's right. Okay, okay, it, it's cool, no worries, no worries. All right, well anyway, I was gonna play this video clip, but that's fine, I'll skip it. Now look, as I go through this information, so what you guys, I'm gonna kinda challenge the way that you're thinking. So there might be a few of you that aren't gonna be very happy with me in the next 20 minutes or so, because I'm gonna tell you some truths about money that you haven't heard before, that your parents didn't teach you, your grandparents didn't teach you, your friends, your colleagues, and your coworkers are not doing or have not told you about. I want you to keep an open mind as I go through this. I'm not here to sell you anything or ask you to buy anything. I just want you to keep an open mind as we go through this. So, okay, so like the information I'm gonna go over with you, I actually heard it for the first time in 2006. I was at a chiropractic conference and I heard someone speaking on this and I watched it and I listened to it and I thought, man, that looks really, really good, but it looks too good to be true. Have you guys ever been just to something like that where you watched something and it seems too good to be true? Well, that was me in 2006. So after I watched this, I didn't do anything. I went home. I actually bought this book at that seminar that I was at. I took it home and I put it on the shelf. I didn't even get it out. And as a matter of fact, I didn't even know there was an audio version of it. So that's the first time I had anything to do just with that book is when I listened to the audio. So anyway, the thing I did is I went home and then I went back to another chiropractic conference about a year and a half later at the end of 2007 or the beginning of 2008. And about 10 or 12 of my colleagues were at that new conference 
okay, that were at the previous one. And so they came up to me and they said, Brent, isn't that banking concept the most powerful thing ever to build your wealth, pay off your debt, keep all the money in your family without having to work any harder, take any additional risk or lose control? And they were just going on and on about this. And I thought to myself, there has to be something to this, right? Because there's no way that 10 or 12 of my colleagues were lying to me. Maybe one or two or three were lying, but not 10 or 12. So I went home and I told my wife, I said, honey, we got to start implementing this concept in our lives. And at that time, we were $984,711 in debt, all right? So my point being is, is just keep an open mind as I go through this. Now, I'm not going to take questions as I'm presenting, but at the end, I will stay as long as you want for questions. I have a 6.45 a.m. flight home to Florida tomorrow morning, so I'll stay up all night and answer all your questions if that's what it takes, right? Now, however, I want to make sure that I do get all of your questions answered. So I want you not to keep the question up here when you think about it because you'll forget it, won't you? So write it down. A short pencil is way better than a long memory. All right? So write the question down to make sure we answer it. All right, here's what a guy named Will Rogers says. He says, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know, it's what people think they know that just ain't so. So a lot of the things that you've been taught about money and wealth may not actually be the truth, all right? We're going to talk about how your money flows. Now, we've already talked about the definition of money, and we said money is a means of exchange. All right, we're going to talk about the method to get all your money back on every product and service that you do. And I'll tell you my real estate okay, story at the end. Well, I'll just tell you real quick right now. So, like, I don't dabble a lot in, okay, so houses per se, as far as investing into houses. The things that I like is the loans right? I want to be the lender. I want the mortgage. I want to be in first position of the mortgage. And I knew I was coming to this event, so I checked it here uh, like three or four days ago, and I currently have $1,255,000 loaned out to 13 people in a total of like 18 different loans. And a lot of those loans are interest only. Some are principal and interest, but I own the mortgage, right? I don't own the property, I own the mortgage. Makes sense? So I'm like the bank. And that's what I'm going to teach you how to do is to how to become the banker. If you want to eventually just become the banker. All right? Makes sense? Um, all right. So we're going to talk about how to get all your money back. Now, I'm going to give you an example, in, okay, just of a car. Now, I know you're thinking, well, Brent, this is a real estate deal. Why are you going to talk about a car? Well, the reason I'm going to just okay the reason I'm going to talk about a car and I'm going to show you how to get all the money back for your car because I bet every one of you in here either owns a car has driven a car or has ridden in a car right <laughs> so you guys understand a car so if I can show you how to get all the money back for all the cars you're ever going to buy drive and own all right it's probably going to work for a house too don't you think or a bicycle or a boat or a motorcycle what we're going to do is turn every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset, every liability into an asset, all right? Now, so here's what I mean by getting all the money back for the car. Because see, all right, so here's how you guys go and buy cars right now. I don't even know you, but I know how you buy a car. The thing that you do is if you go buy a car, so you do it one of three ways. You either pay cash for it, you bank finance it, or you lease it, agree? Because all of you guys look honest, and I don't think you stole your car, right? So, but in order to do the car, okay, just in order to buy the car in, 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 in just like any of those three methods, the thing you have to do is take your money and give it to the car dealer, right? So the thing you do is you give the money to the car dealer, the car dealer gives you the car, he's got the money, you have the car, transaction's over, everybody walks home happy, right? It's over. I'm going to show you how I buy the car. I'm going to take the money. I'm going to give it to the car dealer. I get the car, so he's got the money. I got the car. But now I have a system to get all the money back for that car I just bought. So not only do I get the car, but I get the money back. Would that be pretty cool yeah. if I show you how to do that? Okay, remember, questions, write it down. Short pencil's better than a long memory. I'll take them at the end. All right.
Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the mysteries of money, the machine. I'm going to show you the machine here in just a minute, the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. We'll talk about the mission, the marathon, all right? So this is not a sprint. It's not a get-rich-quick deal. This is something you're going to want to add into your financial life. Again, just one extra step. I'm not going to tell you how to invest your money, right? All we're going to do is add one extra step into your financial life. We'll talk about the millionaire and the movement. All right, so anyway, I have three calculators here on the screen. Now, I'm going to assume you guys are all from Pasadena, California. I don't know if you are or not, but I'm going to assume you are. And I'm going to assume you guys all have a checking account at the local bank of Pasadena, all right? And I'm going to say you have $25,000 in that account, and that account is paying you 4% interest. I know it's not paying you 4%, all right? But I'm going to say you found a really good bank, and that bank's paying you 4% interest. And I'm going to be your banker at that bank, so we'll just call me Baker Brent, right? Now, so the thing you do is you come into the bank, and so basically the thing that you want to do is you want to go buy a car for $25,000. So anyway, so you're in the market to go buy a $25,000 car. So what you do is you come into the bank, and the thing you say, Brent, I want to take out the $25,000 that's earning 4%, and I want to go pay cash for that car. And I say, no, no, no. You don't want to pay cash for that car. Instead, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep this $25,000 in the bank. It's going to continue to pay you 4% interest, and I'm going to make you a loan for $25,000 for that car, and I'm going to charge you 6% interest. And over the same equal time period, our bank will pay you more money on the 4% that you're earning than you'll pay us on the 6% that you're borrowing. Now, is that a true statement? In other words, is it possible for you to make more money, okay, over the same equal time period if you pay 6 and you earn 4? Yes. So, so most of you say no, right? Right, because if you earn four and pay six, you're actually losing two, yes? Well, the banker's telling you the truth, so whoever said yes is correct, all right? But again, that's not the way our minds are programmed to think, because we think if we earn four and pay six, we're losing two. We have to start learning how money works. Now, if we finance a car for $25,000, how long are we normally going to finance it for? I like that answer. I got it plugged in right there, 60 months. Okay, so here's what I'm saying, just to be clear. Our bank is going to pay you more money on the 4% than you'll pay us on the 6% over the same equal time period of five years or 60 months. So here's what happens. The 25000 at 6%, okay, for five years, the payment's 483.32 a month times 60, that means for that $25,000 car over five years, what you're going to pay, okay, so like $29,000. So $25,000 in principal and $4,000 in interest. Are you with me so far? That same money that I told you to leave in the bank and is going to earn 4% over five years or 60 months, you're actually going to have $30,525. Now here's my question. Is this number 30,525, is that a larger number than 28,999? Or do you guys in Pasadena, California do math differently than I do in Port Orange, Florida? It's a bigger number, isn't it? Why is that a bigger number? How can you make more money earning four at the same time you're paying six? Here's what's happening. The car balance is on a decreasing balance, right? The thing that you're doing is you're paying that down each and every month. But the dollars you have in this account is going up every month. So one is on a decreasing balance and the other one is on an increasing balance. Are you with me? Yes. So all I wanted to do with this little exercise is I wanted to prove to you that you can make money all day long earning four at the same time you're paying six. Are we okay with that? Yes? Good. Now, why is that important? Well, let's talk about the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. And the machine that we're going to use is a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. 
Now, I wish you could be standing where I'm at right now so you could see all of your faces. Because I, right now, all of you, I'm looking at you and here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, what in the hell does a whole life insurance policy have anything to do with me building my wealth? That's what you're thinking. Why do you think we would want to use a whole life insurance policy to build our wealth? Any ideas? Tax free, good. Tax -free, good. Anything else? Compounding. Compounding, good. You can borrow. Safe. You can borrow. Safe. Safe. All those are great answers. The number one reason we're doing it is because this is what the rich do. This is what the wealthy do. All right? The number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world are conventional banks. Conventional banks own more in whole life insurance than all of their land and their buildings combined. As a matter of fact, conventional banks have quadrupled the amount of whole life insurance they have purchased since 2013. Now, why do you think banks own so much whole life insurance? Is it because they're stupid or they know something the rest of us don't know? They know something, right? So all we're going to do is we're going to mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy do. Look, guys and gals, so this concept is not brand new. So like, okay, so like I'm not bringing it to the table. This guy here, Nelson Nash, didn't bring it to the table. It's been around for over 200 years. It's how Walt Disney built Disneyland. It's how Ray Kroc funded McDonald's and the mascot we know as Ronald McDonald. It's how Pampered Chef got started before Warren Buffett bought it. J.C. Penney, Foster Farms, Stanford University. It's how the University of Michigan pays their head football coach. It's been around for over 200 years. Our tax code has only been here since 1913. There is so much that we can do in this vehicle with the features and benefits that you cannot do with any other vehicle on the product, on the planet. And, and we'll go through that. Now, why is the four and the six percent important? Because inside of your policy, the guaranteed growth rate is four percent. That's the guaranteed growth rate on your policy is 4%. Now, is that taxable 4% or tax-free? Tax tax-free. Tax-free. And tell me what our largest eroder of wealth is. Taxes. And you guys in California know that better than anyone else. Maybe so like New York's a close second, but you guys know. I mean, it's the only state that I ever know of that had voted to retroactive and pay it more tax, right? But anyway, that's you guys. <laughs> So, all right, now, so the guaranteed 4% is without a dividend, all right? That's just the guarantee. That's not me telling you. That is in your policy contract. If the insurance company pays a dividend, it's higher than 4%. Now, I can't guarantee you the insurance company is going to pay a dividend. So that's why I only talk about the guarantee of 4%. But all the insurance companies that I work with, have been, paying, have been paying out the dividends for over 123 consecutive years. So do you think there's a pretty good chance they'll pay a dividend this year, next year, 5, 10, 20 years from now? Absolutely. But if they don't, it's okay because I'm just talking about the 4% guaranteed. Now, the 6%, why is that important? Because the 6% is the highest interest rate the insurance company will charge you to take a loan. So can we make money all day long by earning four at the same time we're paying six? Are you with me? All right, let's move on. Now, I told you banks are the number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world. And how do you know that's true? Go out and Google BOLI, B-O-L-I. It stands for Bank Owned Life Insurance. You will see the hundreds of hundreds of pages that come up about how much whole life insurance conventional banks actually own. So all we're going to do is we're going to mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy do. All right. We talked about the definition of money is a means of exchange. All right. Now, so who in here believes in compound interest? Show of hands. Almost every hand goes up. Keep them up. Okay. You guys all believe in compound interest. So who in here has a 401k or an IRA? Go ahead. Keep them up. Keep them up. 401k or IRA. Sir, so can I ask you, how old are you today? 
you're 26. How long have you been putting money in that 401k or IRA? Eight months. Eight months? Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, but, right, so like at 26, you probably just started shaving a year and a half ago, right? <laughs> all right, so he's been putting money in there for eight months. So let's just call it a year, round up. Is that all right? Now, how long does that, okay, how long, okay, so how long are you going to have to contribute into that 401k before you can get the money out without paying the penalty? Until what age? 59 and age 59 and a half. So he's 26, so he's got 33 years to go. Now, even when you get the money out, the tax is always going to be there on the money, right? So the only thing that you're avoiding is the penalty. Are you with me? Now, I want to ask you a couple questions. So the reason you guys are putting money in a 401k or IRA is why? Because you want to have more money for later, do you not? That's why you're doing it. Or because your parents told you to do it, your grandparents, your friends, your colleagues, and your coworkers are all doing it. So if they're doing it, you want to do it too. Now, let me ask you a couple questions about that 401k or IRA. Are there any guarantees at all with that money? Well, there is one guarantee. There is one. Actually, so like it's guaranteed to never go below zero. But wouldn't that suck if that happened? Right? So you're right. There are no guarantees, right? Now, tell me who's controlling that money, you or somebody else? Somebody else. Somebody else is controlling it, and there's no guarantees, all right? Now, I want to ask you a few questions. Is a dollar worth more today or in the future? Today. today. If you ever forget that, think about how many candy bars that you can buy for a dollar, okay? Um, just today. Okay, again, I'm sorry. Okay, so kind of think about how many candy bars that you can buy just today for a dollar versus 20 years ago for a dollar. Question number two, are taxes going to go up or go down? They're going to go up. And even if they don't go up, aren't we taxed on more stuff all the time? Now, question number three, if you have a choice to pay tax on the seed, the small amount, or the harvest, the large amount, which one do you want to pay tax on? Seed. The seed. I agree with all three of those answers. But all three of those answers you are violating by putting your money in a 401k, an IRA, or retirement plan, because what you're doing is you're giving up good dollars today, right, to get paid with weaker dollars in the future. You're compounding the tax because the tax is always going to be there. And when you do pay the tax, you're going to pay it at the higher rate. Are you with me? Yeah. Just trying to get you to think about what's going on. Now, compound interest, you guys all say you believe in compound interest. Well, the only way compounding works is your product or your money has to sit still, does it not? It has to sit still. So, in other words, if I want this $20 bill to compound, I've got to take it down to the bank, I put the $20 bill in the bank, and it's got to sit there in order for me to earn interest, does it not? If I go back and get this $20 bill out, it's no longer compounding. So compounding stops the motion of money. Now, motion's a natural law of God, is it not? Everything's in motion. I'm up here moving. My lips are moving. I'm walking back and, f I'm walking back and forth. So, like, I got on an airplane today. The airplane was in motion. I got in an Uber from my hotel, came over here today. I got to say, the traffic really wasn't in motion. <laughs> two hours, two hours from the LAX Hilton to here, Airport Hilton. So, yeah, so, but anyway... Everything's in motion, right? So like how many people, have, or, or, or sorry, how many of you would like to eat fish out of a stagnant pond? You wouldn't want to, would you? So everything's in motion. Compounding stops the motion. But we've all been told compounding's a great thing. I want you to name me one business in the world. You pick any business you want. Name me one business in the world that uses compounding or compound interest. Come on. So the one you're thinking of is what? Banks, right? Banks use compound interest. Well, let's think about that. Do banks really use compound interest? No, they pay you compound interest and they charge you compound interest, but they don't use it. Here's what I mean by that. If I took this $20 bill, I highlighted it in yellow, right? And I take it down to the bank teller and I give it to the bank teller. Does that bank teller take that $20 bill 
So do they go to the back room of the bank and there's a little box there that says Brent Kessler and that's where they put my $20? No. If I go back in a month and I want that same $20 bill back where they give it to me, how about in a week? How about an hour? How about in 10 minutes? No. Why aren't they going to give me the same $20 bill back? Because they're moving it. It's in motion, right? How much money does a grocery store make if groceries are just sitting on the shelf and compounding and not moving? Zero. How much money does a car dealer make if cars aren't moving off the lot? How much are you making in the real estate world if nobody's buying houses, selling houses, right? If, if like they're moving in, and they're moving out, right? Uh, or, or, or house remodels, zero. So not one business in the world actually uses compound interest, do they? So isn't it a little bit strange that all the major institutions that promote compounding and compound interest, such as banks, Wall Street, mutual funds, insurance companies, right, are not compounding their money themselves. You see, they all tell you to take your money and park it with them, but they're not parking it there themselves, are they? I'm just trying to get you to think. Now, let me ask you a couple other questions. You told me money's a means of exchange, and really when you put your money in a 401k, an IRA, a qualified plan, you're letting money sit and compound, and you're letting someone else control it, right? So let me ask you a couple other questions, because you told me food is money, money is food, car is money, house is money, right? Money is a means of exchange, right? And the thing, sir, at age 26, basically what you're going to do is you're going to let that money sit there for at least another 33 years before you get it out, right? Because that's what we do, right? And I'm sure a lot of you just in this room have been putting money into those qualified plans for way more than eight months. You've probably been doing it for years and you still got some time to go until you're 59 and a half, yeah? yeah? So, you told me money's a means of exchange. Let me ask you a couple questions. Let's say if we walk across the street to the grocery store today and buy a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk, okay? Are you gonna wait five, 10, 15, 20, 33 years <laughs> to eat that bread or drink the milk? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? How about if we go buy a car or a house today? You're going to wait 5, 10, 20, 33 years to drive the car or move in the house? That would be ridiculous. Why are you doing that with your money? See, all those things equal money, don't they? See, okay, so the thing is people do things with money they would never do with things that money buys. You would never go to the store and buy a loaf of bread, would you? And bring it home and put it in the freezer and wait 10, 20, 33 years to eat the bread, right? But you'll put money in a qualified plan, a 401k, an IRA, a retirement account, and hope that to get some in the future. And chances are, all of you guys could use that money right now, could you not? I bet you guys could all use some of that money that you're putting there, because I bet you have real estate deals that you can do. Who's using your money? I'm just trying to get you to think, who's using it? All right, now, let me ask you another question. All right, we said there's no guarantees. Oh, and just, so in that retirement account, in that retirement account, tell me everything you know, everything you know about your retirement account right now. Go ahead and tell me, wait, hang on, don't tell me. I'll tell you what you know. You know one of two things. The thing that you know is if that account goes up or down based on the quarterly statements that you get, and you may know if it's invested in a low, moderate, or high-risk category. But other than that, you guys don't know crap about that account, do you? I'm just trying to get you to think, oh, but wait a minute, Brent, but I get a match. That's what you say. I get a match. So when I put my money in that plan, I get a match. Well, is the principal that you put in there guaranteed? No. So is the match guaranteed? Not at all, right? But let's just go with your theory and say that you get a match, okay? Let's say you get a one-to-one -one match. So now what you do is you go down and you put the money in the retirement account and you get a match. Well, we said food is money and money is food. So if we go to the store today and buy a loaf of bread, we bring it home and put it in the freezer, and in 5, 10, 20, 33 years, we open up the freezer and guess what's in there? Two loaves of bread. How much better is that second loaf of bread going to taste? Will it still be freezer burn? I'm just trying to get you to think of what's going on. All right. Now, let me ask you this. 
How many people, I want you to think of all the people that you know at retirement age, all right? Everybody you know that's at retirement age. How many people have you ever met in your life that are totally happy, ecstatic, elated, and excited and joyful about how their retirement plan has performed? Come on, one of you? Give me one. One? Half of? Okay, that's a half a hand up, right? No, out of all the people that you met, I mean, look, most people are not happy. So like, have you guys ever been into a Costco or a Walmart? And if you walk in a Costco or a Walmart, the thing they do is they check your ID, right, as you're going in, or they check your receipt as you're leaving. And a lot of people that are working those jobs are at retirement age. Would you agree? Now, I don't know this for a fact, and I've never done this survey, but maybe someone in here will do it and tell me. Here's what I would do. I would go up to 10 people at those types of jobs that look like they're at retirement age and say, ma'am, sir, are you here at this job at this age working because you really want to be here or because you have to be here because your retirement plan, your qualified plan did not turn out the way that you thought? You guys all know people at retirement age that are out there working not because they want to be, but because they have to be. Just trying to get you to think. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about how a bank works. This is how your bank works, all right? The thing that you do is you put your money in the bank. I'm going to say you have $100,000 you're going to put in the bank. Don't worry about the number. I want you to get the concept. It could be $1 or a million dollars. The point is, is that it's your money, and you found a really good bank that's going to pay you 4% interest on that money. Now, every time you put your money into the bank, that money becomes a liability to the bank, doesn't it? Because they owe you an interest rate, right? So it's a liability to them, yes? How does the bank take your money and turn it into an asset? They loan it. That's what banks do, right? That's what they do. They loan it. They're in the lending business. So a loan is an asset to a bank. But whenever we think of a loan, guess what we think of it as? A payment, a debt, an expense, a liability. We have to start thinking of a loan as an asset. Now, so the bank takes the money that you put in there and they lend it back to you or, or to someone else, right? Because you are the depositor. Who in here besides myself has ever went to a bank to borrow money to buy a house? Yep. So the thing that you do is after you put your money in the bank, now you go to the bank and say, Mr. Banker, I want a loan, okay? Now I want to take a loan of the depositor's money, my money, to go buy a house. Now I'm going to say that the house is going to be 7% interest. Don't get hung up on the numbers. It's not important. I want you to get the concept. If you borrow money from a bank to buy a house, are you expected to pay them back with interest? Yeah. So who's in control of that transaction? The bank. the bank. Who in here besides myself has ever went and borrowed money for a car from a bank? All right, let's call that 8% interest. And if you borrow money for a car, you got to pay them back with interest, don't you? So who's in control of that? How about a house remodel? You guys probably done some of those in the real estate world, right? Maybe granite countertops, a new patio, a basement, a swimming pool, right? So we'll call that 9%, all right? If you borrow the money from the bank, you got to pay it back, don't you, with interest. So look, all right, I'm kind of hoping that you're seeing what's going on here. All banks do is they take money in, move it out, bring it in, move it out, bring it in. It's constantly in motion. That's why that same $20 bill that I highlighted is no longer there because it's in motion. So finally, let's do a debt consolidation loan, pay off all the credit cards at 12%, all right? So who's in control of every one of these transactions? The bank. Now, I know it's late, but let's do a little math. I'll keep the math easy. Let's see how well you did and how well the bank did. Remember, I said you found a really good bank, and that bank's paying you 4% interest on your money. Now, on the house here, the bank made seven and you made four. How much more did the bank make than you? Three. On the car, they made eight and you made four. How much more did they make than you? Okay, nine minus four and 12 minus four. So the bank made 20% and you made four. The bank made 20 and you made four. How much more did the bank make than you? 16%, 16% right? Close. 
What about 500% more than you? Because look, if a, you made $4 and they made $20, didn't they make five times what you made? Banks are making between 400 and 1300% annually on the money that you leave there each and every year. Now I know you're thinking, all right, Brent, I hear you up there moving your lips and flapping your gums. How do I really know that's true? You can go to BauerFinancial.com, B-A-U-E-R, BauerFinancial.com. You can pull up any bank that you want, a small hometown bank, a big bank that we all know the name of, and what you can do is get their annual report. I don't care if you get it from this year, last year, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you will see that banks make no less than 400% annually on the money that you leave there each and every year. If you think about it, it makes sense. I don't care what town we're in. We can be in Pasadena, California, Port Orange, Florida, okay? Wherever we want to go. And we can get in our car, we can drive down the road, we go, okay, we're driving down the road, and we get to a stoplight. And there's four corners at that intersection, is there not? Tell me what at least one building is that you see at least on one of those corners of almost every major intersection. A bank, right? <laughs> Yeah, and there's an ATM in the Starbucks, isn't there? It's a bank, is it not? Now, so are the banks on the bad property, run-down location, bad landscaping, bad architecture, or are they the nicest buildings in town? And you walk in, and they're all nice inside. The people look good, smell good. And sometimes they even give you stuff at a bank, don't they? They'll give you cookies, soda, water, tea, right? Have you been in the banks like that? As a matter of fact, there's a bank in our town that if you go there on a certain day of the week, they give you wine give you wine on a certain day of the week. So guess what day my wife goes to the bank four or five times a day? Yeah, wine day. That's why she's not here tonight. She's hung over. All right. But yeah, they're everywhere, are they not? And so who's paying for all of those? Look, all I want you to do is to be the banker in your own life because you're doing all of this anyway right now, are you not? You're buying houses, you're buying cars, house remodels, and you're using credit cards. Who's getting all of your money? How much risk did the bank take to do all of this? How much risk did they take? Not a lot, because whose money did they use? They used your money, so they really didn't take any risk. Now, I will agree that interest rate offsets risk. So the higher risk that you are as a borrower, the higher your interest rate is going to be. But if you're too high of a risk, is the bank going to loan you the money anyway? No. So we just want to make you the banker in your own life. Okay, there it is, BauerFinancial.com. Banks make 400 to 1,300% annually on the money you leave there. I challenge you to go look it up. If there is a bank, I've been just talking about this since like, since 2012, I've been teaching this stuff, and I've asked this question to almost every audience, and I say, go find a bank that makes less than 400%. Not one person has came back. Maybe someone from this group will come back and tell me that they found a bank that makes less than 400% annually. Now, let's talk about how you spend your money. I don't even know you, but I know how you spend your money. You spend 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles. 20 cents of every dollar goes to cars. I'm not talking about just the cost of the car. I'm talking about the maintenance, the gas, the upkeep, the insurance. You spend 30 cents of every dollar goes to housing. You spend 40 cents of every dollar goes to everything else you do in your life to live. So what you're doing is you're spending 90 cents or 90% of every dollar, and you're trying to save 10 cents or 10%. Now, are you aware of what the average savings rate in America is today? How much are people saving on average? Less than one, I hear five. The last time I checked was about a year ago and it was like 5.5% was the average that people are saving. Now, prior to the recession, it was a negative number, right? But ever since the recession, the thing is, is that people started to hunker down a little bit more and they started to save, right? So, but I'm going to say you guys are all above average and you're saving 10 cents or 10% of every dollar. Now, how do I know you're an above average group? Because Christina and Nick said, Brent, this is an above average group that's here tonight. <laughs> so you guys are above average and you're saving 10 cents or 10% of every dollar. 
Now, when most financial coaches, planners, or advisors, when they come to you to talk about your money, they're talking to you about the amount of money that you're saving, are they not? And they're trying to get you a higher rate of return on what you're saving, yes? But in order to get you a higher rate of return on what you're saving, that involves more risk, does it not? How much more risk do you really want to take with your money? Probably not a lot. Here's where I'm different. I'm not going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're saving. I'm going to talk to you about the amount of money that you're spending already. And if I can just take some of what you're spending and transfer it or move it to your savings category, then haven't I just increased your savings without working harder, without taking any additional risk or changing your cash flow or losing control? Yes? For example, let's say you're spending 20 cents of every dollar goes to automobiles, and we take that 20 and it goes from 20 to 15. And we take that five and move it to savings, and now, now savings goes from 10 to 15. So haven't I just given you a 50% increase on your savings? You with me? Yes. Now, let's talk about what you spend in interest. You spend five cents or 5% of every dollar goes to interest on automobiles. Now I know that there's a couple of you in here are saying, not me, Brent. I don't spend any interest on automobiles. You pay cash. And that's how you guys tell me too. You come up and say, I pay cash for my cars. And you're all proud that you pay cash. Well, let's talk about you paying cash for a car. All right. There's only two reasons that you pay cash for a car. And those two reasons are number one, I don't want any payments. And number two, I don't want to pay any interest. That's why you pay cash for a car. But are those statements really true when you pay cash for a car? All right. So let's make believe that uh, this is a $20,000 bill. Okay. And I go in and I'm going to buy a $20,000 car and I give the car dealer the $20,000 bill. I made one payment of $20,000. Did I not? Or I could go in and make 20 payments of $1,000. It doesn't matter if I have one payment or 20 payments, I still have a payment, do I not? Because even if I pay cash for the car, I gotta start saving for the next car, don't I? Because is the car that you're driving gonna last you forever? Is anybody in here still driving their first car? No, right? And is there anybody in here driving their last car that they're ever gonna buy? No, you guys are going to buy and sell cars. You're going to go in through life, right? So you're always going to be buying cars. The second reason is you say, I don't want to pay any interest. Well, is it true that if you pay cash for a car that you don't pay interest on the car? Well, let's think about that. Remember where the $20,000 bill is. It's in my possession right now, right? So I'm earning money on this $20,000. If I go give it to the car dealer, now that 20000 is gone. It's left my family forever. I've given up all earning right on that $20,000. Are you with me? So even though I didn't pay interest per se, I gave up the interest that I was earning on it. Are you with me? Now, so how do you like to do things? You like to do things randomly or on a systematic basis? Hopefully on a systematic basis, right? Okay, now let's talk about housing. How much interest do you spend in housing? You spend 25 cents of every dollar goes to interest on housing. Now let's drive this home a little bit because you guys are in the real estate world, number one. And I bet a lot of you guys have a house payment. Who in here has a house mortgage right now? So sir, can you tell me on your house mortgage, how much is your interest rate? Rate, what's the rate? Boy, I should know that. Uh, how much is your interest rate? Anybody? 4%, 2%, 5%, doesn't matter. 3, 4, 5, 6. Don't worry, doesn't matter. You don't know. This is going to be good. 3, 4, 5. Doesn't matter what it is, right? Okay, now here's what happens. Every month in the mail comes the house statement. And it says total house payment due. And it's usually the same number every month, is it not? But if you look at that statement each month, it, it's broken down into two sections. A principal section and an interest section. Is it not? Now, let me ask you this. The house statement that just came in the mail, that just came in the mail, so it was the interest portion 
of the total payment, all right, for this month, was it 4% of the total payment or was it a lot more? A lot more. As a matter of fact, over 87% of your total house payment goes to interest in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage. Let me repeat it. Over 87% of your total house payment goes to interest in the first seven years of a 30-year mortgage. How long does the average person stay in their house before they sell it or refinance it? Five to seven. How long have you been in your house? You're renting, so all your money's going out. How long you been in your 10? Who said 10? Have you ever refinanced it? No. No. How long you been in yours? Two. Two. How long were you in your last one? Okay. How long you been in yours? 10? Have you ever refinanced it? How long? 20. Have you ever refied? Twice. Okay. So 20 years, he refinanced it twice, so that's three transactions. Bought it, refied, refied. 20 divided by 3 is what? About 7. So 5 to 7 years. So we can go around the room and play the game, and the average of the room will be 5 to 7 years. So it's not the interest rate that's killing you, is it? The 4% is a good rate. It's not the rate that's killing you. See, we all get hung up in rate, 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 rate. It's not the rate. It's that volume of interest that you're paying. Who's getting all that money? Now, do you know why they're so big and everywhere? You also spend five cents or 5% of every dollar goes to living. So what we're doing, we're spending a total of about 34 and a half percent of every dollar goes to interest to other people. And we're trying to save Ted. Can you see how it might be a little hard to get off the financial hamster wheel doing that? All right, let's move on. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Now, everything else that I'm going to go over is in your handout. I'm not going to tell you how to, all right, I'm not going to tell you how to learn this, but I think if you watch up here, you'd get more out of it, and then you take the handout home and study that in nauseating detail, all right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to get all the money back <coughs> on all the cars you're ever going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. So not only do you get the car, but you get the money back too. Would that be pretty cool? Yeah. Okay, because out of all the cars that you've ever bought. All right? I got a question. Okay, sir, so can you tell me how old you are today? Sure. <laughs> I won't tell anybody. Oh, I've learned that lesson. How old are you? 58 years old. Okay? Now, I'm going to guess you started driving when you were 16, right? So you've been driving for about 42 years, right? The very first car you started driving 42 years ago, is that a car you still have today? No. Do you have your second car and your third and your fourth? The car that you're driving now, is that going to be your last car that you ever buy? No. You've went through life. You've bought and sold cars. All of us have. And we're going to continue to go through life and buy and sell cars. Now, out of all of the cars that you've ever bought up to this point in your life, how much of the money do you have today? Here's a hint. Zero, right? Is there anybody in here that has any more than zero for all the cars you've ever bought, driven, and owned up to this point in your life? No. So if I do nothing else but show you how to get all the money back and have the car, it's been a pretty good day, has it not? Sure. I bet if I do that, you'd probably come up here and give me a big old hug before I left, wouldn't you? Why don't I do it now? Okay, sir, I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to make you come up here and give me a hug. Don't worry. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to get all the money back for all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. And if you can do it with a car, you can do it with a bicycle, you can do it with a boat, you can do it with an airline ticket, you can do it with a house, maybe properties, maybe real estate. All right, now, remember, let's go to the big numbers here. Now, okay, on this sheet, there's a lot of numbers. I'm going to make it easy. On the left is just time. Year 1 to 8, year 9 to 13. Then you have a column here called age and death benefit. Remember the machine that we're using to build our wealth. It's a whole life policy and a mutual company that pays dividends. So you are going to have a death benefit whether you like it or not, okay? Now, age and death benefit are grayed out, are they not? 
because I don't want you to worry about age and death benefit. You don't even have to worry about age and death benefit at all because we're not sitting here tonight talking about death benefit. We're talking about the cash. That's why we're meeting is to talk about cash. But I know there's at least one or two analyticals in the room that have to know about death benefit or you won't let me move on. So let me explain it quickly. Let's say if we have three people, I don't care what ages, they're all different ages. They're all in equal health. They're all in equal health, but they're different ages. We can call them like 30, 40, 50, 20, 40, 60. You pick the age, okay? They all walk into the same life insurance store today. They're all in equal health, and they're going to put in $10,000 of premium into this policy, okay? So like in this example, don't freak out. I'm never going to tell you how much to put in your policy. I don't care if you put $10,000, $1,000, $100, $100, $100,000. I will never, ever tell you how much money to put in your policy. You're going to tell me the amount, all right? But let's take those three people. They're all in equal health. They walk into the same life insurance store today. The only thing different is their age. Who's going to get the most death benefit? The youngest. The youngest. Who's going to get the least death benefit? That just makes sense, doesn't it? That's all we have to know about age and death benefit. Like I said, we're not meeting today about death benefit. We're going to talk about the cash that you have available in your account. So I'm going to prove to you that age doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. Let's talk about cash. Let's take those same three people. I don't care their age. You pick their age. They're all different ages, okay? They all have $20 in their pocket. They walk across the street to the grocery store with a $20 bill. Who's going to be able to buy the most groceries? All the same, right? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the language you speak, how good you look, how good you're dressed how bad you smell, the same 20 bucks buys the same amount of groceries, does it not? So does cash matter when we're, or I'm sorry, does age matter when we're talking about cash? No, 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 no. And the reason I'm driving this home is because at the end of this, somebody's going to raise their hand and say, Brent, that looks really good, but I'm too old to do this. I'm 58. I can't do it anymore. No, it does, age doesn't matter. It only affects the death benefit and not the cash. Sorry, I keep spitting on your head. Oh, you're, good. you're good? All right. <laughs> all right. So now, all right, so here's what this guy's going to do. He's going to put in $10,000 a year for seven years into this policy. Again, don't get freaked out on the number. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Brent, that's ridiculous. I would never put $10,000 a year into a life insurance policy and pay it for seven years. Well, by the time I'm done, you're going to want to put way more than that in, and you're going to want to pay it for a lot longer. You'll see. But in this case, he's putting 10 grand in a year for a total of seven years. In the beginning of the fourth year, he's going to go buy a $25,000 car. He's going to borrow the money, okay? He's going to borrow it from his policy to go buy a $25,000 car. Now, in real life, I would never have you wait four years to start using the cash in your policy. I want you to start using the cash immediately, immediately. And my definition of immediately is within 30 days, okay? Within 30 days. But in this example, I'm going to show you what happens when he waits four years. So this part right here, for a few minutes, you got to trust me on this. If he pays his policy longer and he uses the money earlier, the numbers are only going to be way bigger than what I'm going to show you. All right? You got to trust me on that for a minute. You'll see here in a bit. So the thing he's going to do is he's going to go borrow the money to buy a $25,000 car. And he's going to pay himself back with interest $500 a month or $6,000 a year for a total of five years, which would be a total of $30,000. Now, earlier in this conversation, you told me, you told me, you said, Brent, if I borrow money from a bank, I got to pay the bank back with interest, right? So do you think if you borrow money from yourself, you should pay yourself back with interest? You should, but do you ever do it? No, you guys don't even pay yourself back, period, with anything, much less with interest, do you? You've got to start doing that. You have to treat your money the same way you treat a bank's money. Because if you don't treat your money the same way you treat a bank's money, 
then the thing you're saying is that the bank's money is more valuable than your money. Are you with me? Okay, so let's see what happened here over an eight-year time period, okay? He put in 10 times 7 is 70. He paid back 6 times 5 is 30. So he put in a total of $100,000. But he took out $25,000 to buy the car. So if he put in $100,000 and took out twenty-five. dollars if he put in 100 and took out 25, how much more did he put in than he took out? 75. How much cash does he have in his account? 73,226. So if you take 73,226 and divide it into the 75,000, which is his true net injection, he just got back 97 cents or 97% of every dollar for that very first car. How would you like to have 97 cents back of every dollar for every car that you've ever bought, sir, for the last 42 years? Would that be pretty cool? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that he's doing here? No, man. All he did is he bought a stupid ass life insurance policy. I had to use the word ass because two of you were sleeping. Now you're awake, thank you. <laughs> All right, that got your attention. All he did is added one step in his financial life, did he not? He bought a stupid life insurance policy, and he's using it to buy the car. He's going to buy the car anyway, is he not? Now, that car wears out. So now let's go look at year 9 to 13. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go buy another car for $25,000 in the ninth year. And that $25,000 comes from where? The 73226. Now, I'm no longer going to pay premium into the policy in this example. I'm not paying premium into the policy at all. All I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow to buy the car, and I'm going to pay myself back with interest, just like I was doing before, $500 a month, $6,000 a year for five years. So if you look at year 9 to 13, he took out 25, put back 30. Took out 25, put back 30. So how much more did he put back than he took out? 5000 Yes, are you with me? How much cash does he have in his account? 95. So it grew from 73 to 95, which is a $22,000 growth with a $5,000 net injection. How do you like buying cars my way? Anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I'm doing? And on the handout I gave you, I even go over just like two more cars so the numbers only get better. I'm not going to do that here. You get the idea. Now, watch this. Let's look and see what happened in the last 13 years. Now, sir, you're 58. Does it feel like just yesterday you were 45? <laughs> so 13 years goes by quick, does it not? Look, I'm 52. Feels like just yesterday I was 39. So 13 years goes by quick, does it not? Well, let's see what happened in 13 years, OK? If you look here in year one through eight, he put in 10 times seven is 70, six times five is 30 for a total of 100. And then in year nine to 13, he put in six times five is 30. So he put in 100 plus 30, a total of $130,000 in 13 years. Are you with me? 130. But he took out money to buy two cars, didn't he? He bought a car up here for 25 and then one here for 25 for a total of 50. So if he put in 130 and took out 50, if he put in 130 and took out 50, how much more did he put in than he took out? 80, 80,000. How much cash does he have? It's okay to say it. How much is it? 95. So his net injection is 80, and here he is with $95,000 in his account. Now, I want to make sure I understand what you're telling me. Are you saying through 13 years, he put in 130, he took out 50, so his net injection is 80, and here he is right here with $95,000 today in the account. Is that what you're saying? If that's true, which it is, and he's got 95 in the account, and his net injection is 80, how much did those cars cost you to buy, drive, and own? You made money. That's the way my simple chiropractic mind works right? You made $15,000. Not only does he have $95,000 in the account, guess what else he has? 
two cars sitting on the driveway. A five-year-old car and a 10-year-old car that he's owned, driven, and used, and he can still drive it. He can still own it. He can still use it. He can give it away, sell it, donate it, or whatever, right? So have I just shown you how you're going to get all the money back on all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own? So not only do you have the car, but you get the money back. Now, I told you earlier, how come I'm showing you this in a car example? Because... You guys drive a car, ride in a car, or own a car, so you understand a car. How about if this wasn't a $25,000 car? How about if it was a $50,000 car, and instead of you paying yourself $6,000 a year back, you were paying yourself $12,000 a year? What would happen to the numbers? They would go up. How about if mama and daddy had a $50,000 car? What would happen to the numbers? They would go up. So if I can do this with a car, could I do it with a bicycle? Could I do it with a boat? Could I do it with an airline ticket? Could I do it with a house? What about taxes? California. You guys like to pay taxes out here. Right? So, right. And again, I'm kind of ragging on California about the tax. You have people leaving the state of California just to get out of here because of the taxes. Do you not? I mean, you know that. They're leaving the state, right? So can you get all the money back now on all the taxes that you pay? Absolutely. What about charitable giving? Ooh, you can get all your money back for charitable giving? I know a couple of you are saying, Brent, that ain't right. <laughs> God does not want me to get my charitable giving money back. If God did not want you to get your charitable giving back, he would not have me standing in the room and you sitting here with me explaining on you how to get it back, would he? Do you know any poor people adding wings to any churches? It doesn't matter what it is, ladies and gentlemen. We are now turning every liability into an asset, every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset. We are now recapturing and recycling all of the money that has been leaving our family. Have you guys ever heard of a guy named Robert Kiyosaki? I know you have because you mentioned the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He wrote a book called Second Chance also. In that book that Robert Kiyosaki wrote called Second Chance, this is exactly what he talks about. It's in the book. You guys heard of a guy named Tony Robbins? He wrote a book called Master the Money Game. Or some, who's my Tony Robbins? You're my Tony Robbins person. He wrote a book called Master the Money Game, right? Chapter 5.2 of that book, this is exactly what he talks about. But you guys never saw it when you read it, did you? Have you guys ever heard of a book? There's a new book that came out. It's called The 501K Plan. The 501K Plan. A guy named Ted Benna. Have you heard of Ted Benna? Ted Benna is the inventor of the 401K. He invented the 401K. Guess what Ted Benna says in that book? He says, I put my money into a 501K plan. He tells you, this is the inventor of the 401K plan. He's saying, don't put your money in the 401K plan. That's what he's telling you. He says, I designed it, but because of government intervention, it is not working the way that I intended it to work. So don't put your money in a 401k plan. Instead, he talks about a 501k plan. Now, a 501k is a made-up name. It's a made-up name that he made up. And a 501k plan is what? It is a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Here's the inventor of the, 501k, or the 401k plan telling you not to put your money in a 401k plan. Go read the book. It's the 501k plan. Ted Bennett goes on to say that 75% of his net worth is in his 501k plan, his whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Now, why do you think that is? Is it because he's stupid or he knows something the rest of us don't know? This is the inventor of the 401k plan telling you this. I'm not. Go read it. I was surprised, too. I was shocked. I'm like, I'm going to use that in all my presentations. All right. So... There are three rules that you got to follow, though. Rule number one is pay yourself first. Premium deposit. Whenever you put money into your whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, that's designed specifically and engineered specifically for high cash value, it's treated more as a deposit when you pay your premium. I know it's a payment. I get it. It's a payment. But if it goes into an account that you control, is it treated more like a payment or a deposit? A deposit. And tell me what word you like better, payment or deposit. Have you ever made too many deposits in your bank account? Ooh, did you hear the lady say no loud? Right? No, right? 
So pay yourself first. But I know you guys, you don't do it. And you've heard it before. You've heard tons of people come up here and say, pay yourself first. But you don't do it. I know what you do with your money. Here's what you do. Every time you get your money in, you take your money, you put it into the conventional bank of Pasadena, California, somebody else's bank, and guess what you do with it? You pay the house people, the car people, the student loan people. You pay the groceries. You pay the food, the travel, the entertainment. You pay for Bobby's soccer practice, Susie's piano lessons, and you hope there's money left over for you at the end. You have to start paying yourself first. Rule number two, pay yourself with interest. You pay a bank back with interest, don't you? Look, all of you guys in here that have payments, do you ever think about skipping the payment at all? Never. You would never skip a payment, right? Well, you think about it. All right. All right. I, I walked right into that one. You think about it. But do you ever skip payments? No, because they will come and pick up your crap if you don't make the payment, right? So treat your money the same way. Pay yourself back with interest. And rule number three, recycle and recapture all your money. And if it works for a car, it works for anything else. Pay yourself first, pay yourself with interest, recapture and recycle your money. There's those two books right there. Second chance. I don't know what chapter it's in in this book, but in this chapter, it's chapter 5.2. And I don't have the new book up there, the 501k plan um, by Ted Benna. All right, last thing I'm going to go over. Now I'm going to show, after I go through this, you're going to see how I paid off $984,711 of debt in 39 months, all right? Now, I gave you this as a handout. I know some of these numbers might be hard. Can we cut these lights down just a little because I think that'll make it a little bit better for you to see? But you guys all have handouts there, okay? Now, I'm not going to use my exact example, okay, um, because it'll take too long, but I'm going to use another example. Now, this is called a money multiplier map. For all of our clients, we create you a money multiplier map, not just one, we create you two to three a year, every four to six months, because your financial life today is not the same as it was six months ago, a year ago, two, five, ten years ago. And your financial life in six months, two years, five or ten years from now is not going to be the same either. It's going to change because what you're going to do is you're going to go through life. You're going to buy things, sell things. You're going to have windfalls, downfalls. You're going to get raises. You're going to get demotions. So it's always changing. So we're going to create you the, a new map, okay, every four to six months. Now, if you look over here on the left, all it is is time, right? It has year one, year two, and then month one to 12, 13 to 24, and so on. Now, in this example, he's going to put in $25,000 into his policy. The last example was $10,000. This guy's going to start with $25,000. I don't care how you pay it. You can pay it monthly, quarterly, annually, twice a year, and you're going to tell me the amount you want to pay. I'm not going to tell you. But a lot of you say, Brent, how much should I start my policy for? I'm not going to tell you. So here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to say, is it Jamie? Is that right? Jamie? Okay. All right, that's not what that says. Okay, let me ask you. What does it say? Oh, hi, man. Okay, I got it. I, I, I got it now. I was thinking it was totally different. All right. So, like, is there like a John? All right, look. All right, so here's my question Are you worth $2.50 an hour? More than that, but you're worth at least two fifty an hour, right? So here's what he just told me. He just says I'm worth at least two fifty an hour. So that means he's willing to pay himself first two dollars and fifty cents an hour. How much is two fifty an hour? How many hours in a work week generally? Forty. Two fifty times forty, a hundred bucks a week, four hundred bucks a month, five thousand dollars a year. So maybe your number is not 25,000, it's 5,000. Oh, but now he's saying, well, Brent, since you put it that way, maybe I'm only worth a buck 25 an hour. <laughs> That's okay too. A buck 25 an hour times 40 hours a week, 50 bucks a week, $200 a month, $2,500 a year, okay? You decide the amount that you wanna put in the policy. It's totally up to you. Are you with me? 
In this case, he put in $25,000. Now, here's how he showed up at our door. He showed up at our door and he owed all of these debtors. He owed 12 third-party debts. And if you add all of these debts across, it comes to $469,000 and some change. So let's round down and just say it's four fifty, dollars because I want to under-promise and over-deliver. So on your paper, I want you to write down that he owes $450,000 in third-party debt. And he's going to put in $25,000 a year towards that debt. Now, let's say that you owed $450,000 and you're going to put in $25,000 a year towards the debt. And let's assume there's no interest. How long is it going to take you to pay that debt off? A long time, right? $25,000 goes into $450,000, 18 years. So on your paper, write down he owes four, 19, 18, right? Yeah, right? 18. Okay, write, okay, on your paper, he owes 450. He's going to put in 25,000 a year, and it should take him 18 years to do it. Let's walk through it and see how well he does. First of all, let's see who he owes. He owes Discover, Chase, American Express, Barclays, Lowe's, Nordstrom's, Wells Fargo. Those are all credit cards. He owes private loan, BMW, West Marine, a condo, and a house. Okay? And in each of the box, it shows you how much he owes. It shows you the interest rate, how long he has left to pay, and his minimum monthly payment. Are you with me? Add them up together, left to right. It's more than $450. let us just call it $450. All right? Should take us 18 years at $25,000 a year, assuming there's no interest, which there is. So here's what he does. In the very first month of the first year, he puts in $25,000 into his policy. He immediately borrows out. How soon is immediately? 30 Within 30 days, he immediately borrows out $14,000 and some change. He takes that $14,000. He pays off all of Discover, all of Chase, all of American Express, all of Barclays, and he pays lows down from $9,500 to $7,600. He takes that money that he was paying these first four creditors, which is 160 a month, plus 200, plus 200, plus 220, and then he adds it all up, and that comes to $768 a month that he was paying the third-party creditors, but now since they're paid off, he's going to pay himself back that money. Are you with me? By doing this, is he having to do any harder work? Is he working harder? Is he changing his cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control? No, he's only changing who gets the money, agree? Before they were getting it, now he's getting it. So he's going to continue to pay himself back into his own account, into his own account. I call it a miscellaneous account, but it is your account. It's just like your own checking account or your own savings account. And that money that you pay yourself back you can use immediately again, not as far as immediately 30 days. I'm talking about immediately, okay, now, today. Are you with me? He gets to the end of the first year, beginning of the second year, month 13. He puts in the $25,000 again. He immediately, how soon is immediately? 30 days. Within 30 days, he borrows out almost 15000 So he takes this here, which is almost fifteen. dollars Plus the 9400 he's been paying himself back the previous 12 months, and now he's got 243. He takes that 24300 he pays off all of Lowe's, he pays off all of Nordstrom's, he pays off all of Wells Fargo, and he pays the BMW down from 17000 to 15000 He takes that money that he was paying those three creditors, he was paying Lowe's $287 a month, Nordstrom's $276, and Wells Fargo $271. Add those up, add it to the $786 he was paying himself back, and now he's paying himself $1622 a month. Is he working harder? Changing his cash flow, taking any additional risk, doing anything stupid or crazy? No, ma'am. He just bought a stupid life insurance policy, and he's using it for his banking system to pay down his debt. Are you with me? If you notice here in month 18, I think it is, if you look at the private loan, since the private loan only had seven months left, it now pays off on its own. So that just pays off during the normal course of the loan. 
So since that paid off and he was used to paying it anyway before, now we take the 720, or is it, no, 922, okay, we take the 922, we add it to the 1622 that he was paying himself, and now he's paying himself 2544 a month. Are you guys with me? We get to the end of the second year, beginning of the third year. Month number 25. Now we put in the 25,000 again, and how much can he use? 22,000. How soon can he use it? Immediately. If you notice, the numbers are continuing to go up each and every year, are they not? Because in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, the cash value is guaranteed to increase and the death benefit is guaranteed to increase each and every day. It's not me telling you, it is in your policy contract. Today's better than yesterday, tomorrow's gonna to be better than today. So now we take the 25 that we put in, so we can use 22 of it, plus the previous 12 months we paid ourselves back a total of 25, so 25 and 22 is 48 right there, right? So now we take the 48, we pay off the BMW, we pay the BMW off, which was 500 a month. So now we add the 500 a month to the 2544 that we were paying ourselves each month. And now we're paying ourselves $3,044 a month. Are you with me? Now, if you've been sleeping up to this point, you got to wake up for this. I got two aha moments, and this is one of them. This is one of the two aha moments. Now, how long have we been putting just the dollars into the policy? How many times have we paid 25,000? Three years. Is that a total of 75,000? How much are we using of that 75? Remember in the first year, we used 14 and some change. Second year, 14 and some change. Third year, 22 and some change. We'll just call it 50. So we put in 75 up to this point, we're using 50. We put in 75 and we're using 50. How much is in the policy? 25, 25 right? Because 75 minus 50 is 25. No. All $75,000 is in your policy growing and compounding at that guaranteed tax-free growth rate, even though you're using 50 of it. Thought you guys would be a little more excited about that. <laughs> Is that cool or cool? Look, I don't know of another product on this planet with these features and benefits that does this. And if you know of one, let me know, because I've been looking since 2006 and I haven't found it yet. So all of your money is growing inside the policy tax-free. All 75 is growing even though that you're using 50 of it. Here's why. Because when we take a loan from the policy, we are not taking our money out of the policy. That $50,000 is not our money that we're taking. What we're doing is we're putting our policy up for collateral and we're taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So our money is continuing to compound even though we're using it. There's no interruption of compound interest whatsoever. Do you know how powerful that is? All right. And I already showed you how you can borrow at a higher rate than what you're earning and make money all day long, did I not? So we solved that problem earlier. All right, now, let's go back. If you notice in the 27th month, we have enough money to pay off West Marine. So that pays off. So now we take the 1261 a month, add it to the 3044, and now we're paying ourselves 4305 a month. Are we working harder? Changing our cash flow, taking any additional risk or losing control? No. no. All right. Now we get to the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year. 25,000 we put in. Now how much can we use? Almost 26, right? So we put in 25 and now we can use 26. Pretty cool, right? So now, are you ever gonna wanna stop paying your premium? Knowing that, every time you give me 25 bucks, I give you $26. You wanna do that all day long? Yeah. All day, you'll meet me here all day in and day out, won't you? All right, so now we put in 25 and we got 26 to use. 
That's about my 10 minute window. All right. So now we got the 26 plus the 41 for a total of 67. We take that 67, we pay down the condo, not off the condo. We pay down the condo because I don't have enough money. So it goes down from 81 to 12. So I'm not going to pay myself back any more than I was paying myself back before because I said I don't want to change your cash flow. Are you with me? All right. So now we get to the end of the fourth year, beginning of the fifth year. We put in 25. Now we have almost 27 to use. 27 plus 51 is 78. The condo's paid off. Now we pay the house down from 181 to 102. Now we get to the end of the fifth year, beginning of the sixth year. Now we put in 10,000 into the policy. I won't go into why. I'll do that in a question and answer session if you want. But just know that we're going to drop the premium down by 60% after four to five years generally. Okay? We're going to drop it down. And I'll, I'll go into that in the question and answer session. It's not important that you know that right now. But here's what, I, here's what is important. Now when you put in 10000 into the policy, how much can you use right away? 13. Now I'm not a math genius or anything. And I'm not the, again, guys, I'm not the brightest candle on the cake or the sharpest tool in the shed. But I know this. If I put in 10 grand and I got 13 to use right away, that is a 30% increase on my money, is it not? How much of your money do you want growing at 30%? all of it now guess what's going to happen next year i'm not going to get to this in my presentation but guess what's going to happen next year when i put in 10. that number is going to be even higher than that number is it not because it's guaranteed to continue to go up each and every year so now what i do is i start a second policy a branch office right so all right guys so, all right, so anyway, I want you to think of your checking account that you have right now at your bank. So the bank that you bank with, is there one branch or multiple branches? Multiple, multiple branches. So can you have multiple branches of your bank? Sure. Absolutely you can, right? So if you work with us, you're never going to wait more than five years to start a second policy. I work with over 2,300 clients in every state of the country. Well, every state except for Maine. I don't know why. I don't have a client in Maine yet. Are you guys from Maine, anybody? <laughs> well, there you go. Maybe I'll get my first client in Maine. But I have over 2,300 clients. 91% of my clients that have been with me a year or longer come back and start additional policies because they see how powerful this is, how effective we work with them, and how efficient it is. Of those 91%, 70% come back before the first year is even up. Now the reason I tell you that, because if everything that I'm sharing with you tonight was not working, do you think nine out of 10 would be coming back for more? Absolutely not. So now we start a second policy, so let's look, we're almost done. We got the new policy that we can borrow 14,000, the old one 13, so 27 plus 65 is 93. We only owe 90 on the house. So now we've just eliminated, we've just eliminated that last debt on that last house. So we just paid off almost $470,000 of debt. How long did I say it was going to take us to do it? Earlier? 18 years. It didn't take 18, 15, 10. We did it in five years and a month. How happy do you think that family was? Did they do anything stupid, crazy, or ridiculous? Could they have went faster if they wanted to? Yeah, they could have, right? So they could have paid more premium. They could have started a policy earlier, a second policy earlier. They could have paid themselves back more. Could they have went slower? Sure, they could have paid themselves a buck twenty-five an hour, not paid the loan back, right? It's it's up to you how fast you go. You can go slow. You can go fast. Nobody in your state has ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. It hasn't happened. Go look it up and find it. Show me. It's never happened. Now, let's go through one other thing on this. So they paid off 470 grand in debt, did they not? Almost? 450, 470? How much did they put in in order to pay that debt off, keeping their cash flow the same? How much did they put in the first year? 25? 
25, 25, 25 for five years, that's 125, plus 10 is 135, plus 25 is 160. They injected $160,000, paid off almost $470,000 of debt, kept their cash flow exactly the same. Now do you see how I paid off 984,000 in 39 months? I just went faster, that's it. I just went a little faster. All right, here's my second aha moment. Go to the condo in the house and let me show you how much more money you would have in your pocket if you just continue to pay yourself back the amount of money you had already agreed to pay the bank. So on the condo, go to the first month of the first year. How much, is, how much was his monthly payment on the condo? Was it $11.79 a month? Yeah. How long did he have left to pay on it? Uh, no, on the, con on the very first month. How long did he have left? 122, but now we've been doing this for 61 months, so let's be fair. So if I take 122 minus 61, that means he would still have 61 months left to pay on the condo, would he not? He would still have that time left to pay because if he wasn't doing this, he would still owe the bank, the mortgage company, another 61 months at 11.79 a month. Do you agree? How much on the house was his monthly payment? How many months did he have left? 219, subtract 61, he would still have 158 months left to pay, wouldn't he? So if he does nothing else but just play honest banker with himself, pay himself back the money he had already agreed to pay the condo and the house people, he would have a total, add those two numbers up, 71 and 224, he would have $295,000 in his pocket plus the house and the condo. If he doesn't do it, who's getting all the money? Who's getting all your money? But it gets better than this, because remember inside of the policy, we have what? A guaranteed growth rate. The death benefit, too, and I'm not even going there, but you are right. We have a guaranteed growth rate. And how much is that guaranteed growth rate tax-free? 4%. 4%. So we got to add 4% on those numbers. So if he just pays himself back what he had already agreed to pay the bank, he would have a total of $371,000 more in his pocket, plus the condo and the house all without working harder, changing his cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control. All he did is add one stupid life insurance policy. That's it. He's not changing anything else in his life, is he? He just bought a stupid life insurance policy, and he's using it to pay down his debt. Now that you know this, everybody should do it, in my opinion. Because if you don't do this now that you know it, not only are you stealing from yourself, you're stealing from your children, your grandchildren, and future generations to come because you're letting money leave your family. See, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays, they all understood how to keep money in their family. All we're going to do is do what the wealthy do. Look, there's you and I and the super wealthy. You and I and the super wealthy. The only thing different, okay, again, there's us and the super wealthy. All of us have access to the same financial tools. Do you agree? The only thing different between us and them is they use the tools differently. Now that I know how to play the game, I'm just playing the game right along with them and getting rich right along with them. Have you guys ever heard of a guy named Warren Buffett? Yes. I think about this quote every day of my life. I don't know when he first said it, but I heard it in October of 2008. And I, again, I said earlier, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, the brightest candle in the cake. cake. It took me 13 trimesters to pass 10 trimesters of chiropractic college. Actually, so like, yeah, so like, who's my chiropractor in here? It took me 13 trimesters to pass 10 trimesters of Logan Chiropractic College because I failed classes. It's Kettner, right? Remember Norman Kettner? Guess why I know his name? Because I kept repeating his damn class. <laughs> That's why I remembered his name, right? Once I passed, I walked across the stage, I got my diploma, I couldn't practice because I had to pass this thing called national board exams. I failed part three of national board exams three times. And so they only give you the test once every six months. I failed it three times. So I am definitely not the brightest candle on the cake or the sharpest tool in the shed. But I listened to this quote and this is how simple it is to me. And I think about it every day in my life and it's this simple. If poor people would just start doing what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. 
How much sense does that make? That's all we're going to do is mimic the rich and what they've been doing in a 200-year-old concept. See, this concept is not on trial. It's not just something we're testing out. It's been around for 200 years. Only one of two things are going to happen to every one of us in this room in the next 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, 10 months, 10, 20, 50 years. Only one of two things are possible. We're either going to live or we're going to die. Now, I like to use the word graduate, but you use whatever word you want. <laughs> but we're going to live or we're going to die, are we not? If we live, are we better off with or without this program I just shared with you? If we die, not if we die, but when we die, are our beneficiaries better off with or without? Yeah, because of the death benefit, right? How much tonight did I even talk about death benefit? How much did I even talk about life insurance? I mean, life insurance is the machine, it's the vehicle that we're using. If there's another vehicle that works better with these features and benefits, tell me what it is. I'm all ears. So God gave me two ears and one mouth, so I should be listening twice as much as I talk. I'm still not very good at that. I'm still working on it. How much should I talk about policies that are exempt from judgments and liens in most states? California not being one of them. But that's okay. You form a collateral assignment on the policy, and now it is protected. How much should I talk about the internal growth grows tax-free in the policy? How much should I talk about loans? Your loan on the policy never has to be paid back because you're continuing to pay your premium, a loan never has to be paid back. A loan on the policy is simply a prepayment of your death benefit. You're borrowing against your death benefit. See, totally contraindicated of what the qualified plan 401k IRA world is doing. They want your good dollars today and they wanna pay you back with non-guaranteed weaker dollars in the future. I'm just changing the game. I'm going to use my good dollars today and pay them back with weaker dollars in the future. Are you with me? Yep. So the loan does not have to be paid back because it'll come out of your death benefit. Now, why are we doing all of this? It's probably not the only reason, but it's one. <laughs> it works better when the sound system's working. All right, look. If this is something that you want to do, or if you want to talk about how it can work for you, on the last page of that handout, the very last page of the handout, I want you to give me your name, your phone number, and your email. Only if you want to talk about this. Do not be nice and just give me the paper to give it to me. All right? Only if you really want to talk about this, and then we'll go over your own situation and how this will work for you. Now listen, if you give me this information, make sure you write it down so we can read it. And here's the other rule. If you give it to me, make sure you give me a contact number that you will actually answer when I call or text you. Do not make me go through your gatekeepers to find you. Fair enough? So don't give it to me if you're not going to answer the call or answer the email. All right? And so either me or someone else on my team will contact you. And if it's not me, because you guys are a real estate group, I got another guy on my team, his name is Chris Noggle. He has a company called Flip Out Academy. That's his company, Flip Out Academy. He's out of Buffalo, New York. And he had a TV show on HGTV called Risky Builders. I've been speaking at his events for about five or six years. He had the TV show for one season. It did get picked up again after one season because Discovery Channel bought HGTV and then and so Discovery Channel didn't want to take on all right so any new housing shows so it didn't get picked up sad for him but good for me because now he's on our team but he's very well versed in the whole real estate world and how to use these policies for that he's been a client of mine for several years but he's been working with me for a couple there's my um, contact info. If you did not, or if, okay, or, or so like if you want to go back and watch what I just did, the thing you can do is go to our website, scroll to the bottom of the homepage where it says members area. And actually, I don't think the password is there anymore. I think if you just click on it, you can watch this presentation again. 
or it's also broken into 10 individual sections, or if there's somebody that you think should watch it that's not here that should watch it. Okay, and again, I gave you this on a handout too. You have this. Again, it's okay to take pictures, but it's also on a handout as well. Um, again, guys, everything I do is word of mouth and referral, so if there's anybody that you know that should hear this information, share the love, all right? My kids are tired of wearing that. My kids are tired of wearing old, wore-out sneakers. <laughs> All right. I am done. Thank you.